Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today on this occasion for our next installment of Hidden Collections, your opportunity to go into the archives and collections of the Martha's Vineyard Museum. My name is Nora Kyle Messier, and I am the Manager of Education and Public Programs here at the Martha's Vineyard Museum. I'm delighted you are all joining us today. If this is your first time attending one of our events, as I like to call them, one of our virtual programs, I welcome you. If you are returning for another exciting episode of season two of Hidden Collections, welcome back. Um, it is our custom at the Martha's Vineyard Museum to begin all of our programs, whether live and in person or online, with an acknowledgement of whose land this was and is, and that is indigenous land. The place that we call Martha's Vineyard has long been known as Noepe, an island that has been in the care and stewardship of the Wampanoag people for time out of mind for thousands, hundreds of generations and thousands of years. We are continually grateful for them as a continued presence in our community, and we hope that for generations yet to come, they will continue to be the stewards of this place and to help us in learning to be good stewards of the land that we are on now here at the Martha's Vineyard Museum and all across North America. Our presenter today is none other than Bo Van Riper, our outstanding research librarian. Hi, Bo. <laughs> You're right. And he is going to be regaling us with the unusual and exciting elements of our collection related to one of our new exhibits, if I remember correctly, something that has just recently opened, a new exhibit called Learning to be Modern. So I hope you very much enjoy the presentation. If you have any questions, please just pop them right into the chat. I will be keeping an eye on that, and we will set aside some time at the end for questions and answers. So without further ado, thank you, Bo. Take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Nora. And thank you, Savannah, behind the scenes, who is changing slides and whatnot. Warning to be Modern is the story of the vineyard from 1921 to 2021, which is to say the story of vineyard history as virtually everybody now alive remembers it. But it's not just one story, but rather many stories. And what I'd like to talk about today is some artifacts and pieces out of the archives that illustrate some of the many stories that are interwoven through the Learning to be Modern exhibit. This two-page bill is seemingly the most mundane of objects but when you look more closely at it, you realize that what it is is a bill from Pratt Brothers Electrical Contractors in 1922 put electrical wiring in the Kapawak Theater, then about seven or eight years old. This points to one of the great transitions that the vineyard under was starting to undergo in the 1920s, the widespread build out of modern infrastructure, including things like paved roads, previously confined to downtown Oak Bluffs, electrical lighting, and telephone service. Those transitions unfolded over the course of decades. The last of the major island highways wasn't paved until just before World War II. Telephone service didn't, dial telephone service didn't come till the 50s down up island and the 60s down island. And Gay Head didn't have electricity until 1951. This small bit of commercial paperwork from 1920 hints at the beginnings of the electrification of the vineyard. Public spaces in general tended to get electrified before private homes did. But it also, as we'll see in a few more slides, points to the rise of movies as a form of entertainment, something that had begun nationwide with the new century, which really came into its own on the vineyard right around 1920. Next slide, please. Not all infrastructure changes from the 1921 to 2021 era actually came to pass, however. The mid-20s proposal, 1923, if memory serves, to build a bridge from Chappaquiddick to the Edgartown mainland across the narrows of Katama Bay, what used to be known as the swimming place, 
turned out to go nowhere, despite promises by its boosters that the increase in property values on Chappaquiddick would pay for the project immediately. Next slide. The red lines just by the mouth of Caleb's Pond here on this map um, show where the bridge would have gone. The people of Edgartown elected to not fund a three-story, a three-span steel girder bridge across the narrows of Katama Bay and chose instead to build a new consolidated school for the town that would unite the lower grade students who'd been going to the North School off Mill Street with the upper grade students who'd been attending the South School on high and at the corner of High and School Streets. The new school opened at Robinson Road in 1924 and the decision to build it, moving the Edgartown High School students under a new roof along with the lower grade students, effectively killed for a generation plans to build a unified high school serving all the Down Island towns. Next slide. The idea of a unified high school or a union school resurfaced after World War II, however, as this 1948 report from the Education Collection makes clear. This was the first post-war feasibility study of a union high school, one that would bring together the high school students then divided out among Oak Bluffs, Edgartown, and Tisbury into a single island-wide institution. That gave way to further studies and further reports. And by 1956, next slide, this Build Better Schools for a Better Community brochure had been put out by the by the regional high school planning board by 1957 plans had been drawn up for the high school building we all know and love well we all know and some of us love and you can see a brochure advertising that school in the learning to be modern exhibit along with next slide please materials related to another island-wide institution, the Martha's Vineyard Commission, which was brought into existence an outgrowth of the old Dukes County Regional Planning Board in 1974-1975. This brochure donated by the family of the late Hector Aslan earlier this year represents the first report of the commission in its first full year of operation and its opening pages lay out its purpose and the steps that had been taken to merge a variety of planning agencies into a single board that would have authority over the entire island and that would, as the report suggested, address districts of critical planning concern where the actions taken in one town had the ability to affect the entire island. The emergence of a regional island consciousness, of a consciousness that overrode the old tendency of the vineyard to behave like six towns, six islands surrounded by land, was one of the defining features of the century covered in the Learning to be Modern exhibit. And in the course of the exhibit, you see it play out not only in things like the regional high school and the formation of the Martha's Vineyard Commission, but also in battles over development and the few economic future of the island and how to balance the needs of growth and a thriving economy against the need to preserve the island's wild natural places that gave it its distinctive look and feel and much of its appeal to outsiders. Next slide, please. I noted that movies as a form of public entertainment really came into their own in the early 20s as the silent era reached its artistic peak. One of the films that would have been shown on the island in the early 1920s was along with Annabelle Lee, a thoroughly forgettable melodrama about a poor but lovely girl who falls in love with a hardworking young fisherman who her rich family despises, um, was Elmer Clifton's silent drama, Down to the Sea in Ships. 
Down to the Sea in Ships was filmed when the whaling industry in New England was in its final years of existence. And some of the seagoing scenes were shot on board the bark Wanderer that would make the last whaling voyage under sail out of New England port three years later. James A. Tilton, the retired Chilmark whaling master who'd spent years in the Arctic around the turn of the century, served as a consultant to the film and handled the wanderer when she was under sail. This brochure shows, belongs to a rescreening of the film, courtesy of the old Dartmouth Historical Society, the forerunner of the New Bedford Whaling Museum, at the West Tisbury Congregational Church sometime probably in the 1930s or early 40s. By that point, the era of whaling under sail, though men like Ellsworth West could still remember participating it, in it, had passed into history. And films like Clifton's, as well as the Charles W. Morgan, by then a museum ship, were the only tangible reminders of what had been an industry that within living memory, the vineyard had participated fully and completely in. Next slide, please. Radio too came into its own as a commercial entertainment medium right around 1920. The first commercial radio broadcasts in America were made in 1919. And by the eve of World War II, Radio entertainment was, a, was an important part of American life. This particular flyer comes from 1946, immediately following World War II, but it illustrates something that radio did for America as a whole, but particularly for rural America, places like the towns of Martha's Vineyard that's little recognized today. In an era where most people in rural America never had the opportunity to hear the leading classical musicians and orchestras and vocalists play live because the cities where such people and organizations played were too far away and too hard to get to, radio programs like the Sunday Evening Hour sponsored by Ford Motor Company brought the music via the airwaves to them. And somebody sitting at their on their living room sofa or their kitchen table in Vineyard Haven could tune in on a Sunday night in 1946 and hear, for example, Andre Segovia accompanied by an orchestra led by Sir Thomas Beecham, something that would 20 years, 25 years earlier, have been completely impossible and incomprehensible, utterly without, utterly beyond the reach of an ordinary vineyarder. Yet radio with its enormous reach across the country and across the globe made it possible, bringing the world, the musical world, the dramatic world closer to the people of the vineyard. Next slide, please. The century between 1921 and 2021 also brought the vineyard more tangibly, physically closer to the mainland and to the larger world of which the, ma of which the mainland was part. Dairies like the Purity Creamery, which advertised itself with this coaster found in the Martha's Vineyard Dairies collection, had until the 1920s sold largely on island with the relatively few exceptions like Seven Gates Creamery, which exported its butter hither and yon across the Northeastern United States. As transportation between the islands and the mainland became faster, more reliable, more extensive during the 20s and 30s with the advent of the so-called Great White Fleet, four modern ferries brought onto the line in the 1920s. Local dairies found themselves in competition with dairies, huge multi-million dollar dairying conglomerates like H.R. Hood and Company, 
on the mainland who were now able to ship their product to the island relatively easily. By the years after World War II, next slide please, the situation became even more dire for local island dairies because the advent of new roll-on, roll-off ferries like the Islander of 1950 made it possible for 14 and 18 wheel trucks to be brought to the island and made it even more possible to link island grocery stores and restaurants to mainland distribution networks that because of economies of scale could undersell local dairies. Local dairies on the island had already by the mid 1930s started to create, try to create a bulwark against that kind of competition, banding together to form the Martha's Vineyard Cooperative Dairy, which allowed many small producers like William Silva of Indian Hill Road with his 14 cows and 50 gallons of milk at a shot to sell their milk to the dairy cooperative, which in turn marketed it to local businesses and local stores at a lower rate than individual farmers could manage on their own, allowing them to compete to some degree against the mainland large mainland conglomerates. Next slide, please. The dairy cooperative served modest sized farmers like Silva, but it also, for example, served Horace Atherton with his two cows, or, next slide, Joseph Howes of West Tisbury with his single cow. The dairy cooperative was, in a sense, another example of regionalization, but it, even it ultimately was unable to compete against mainland economic competition. By 1960 or so, the dairy cooperative had shut down and virtually all the dairy products on the island were being, were being, at least those being sold commercially at scale, were being brought in by truck on the ferries from the outside world. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. This letter was written from the USO in Buffalo, New York, by Edwin G. Tyra to his new wife, Helen Shirtleff Tyra, in the midst of World War II. It's one of many letters from Edwin to Helen that Helen dutifully saved in a scrapbook, which her daughter Pat donated to the museum earlier this year. And it, along with this letter, next slide, please, written from Edwin's duty station at a small boat and a Navy small boat station in North, in Virginia. That is not, in fact, a small boat, but an IO class battleship. But, you know, the Navy is always interested in promoting their biggest and best pieces of equipment. So even if you're handling a small utility craft, you still get to, um, right on stationary, decorated with a picture of something that's shelling a beach on Okinawa as you write the letter. In any event, Edwin's letters to Helen over the course of the war come from places all over the country, just as Lieutenant Commander Henry Scott's duty orders, which are collected in another part of the archives, show his move, his movements from Ohio to Oklahoma to Quonset Point and finally back home to Martha's Vineyard, where he spent the last months of the war stationed at the Naval Auxiliary Airfield that's now the Martha's Vineyard Airport. Other World War II service members like Hector Aslin came to the vineyard for the first time from points beyond when they were stationed here. And World War II as a whole had the effect of not only bringing people to the vineyard who had never been here before, some of whom stayed, some of whom married, some of whom settled down, but also taking vineyarders not just to far flung parts of the country, but to far flung parts of the globe. My father, an 18 year old drafty private left Tisbury in the fall of 1944 and found himself successively on Okinawa and then in Korea and then back home at 20 years old, his view of the world forever widened by 
having participated in a global conflict. Next slide, please. Edwin Tyra, for his part, got to see what it was like to be off duty in New Orleans in that last summer of the war. And like the people who listened to the radio or went to the silent films at the Capitol Walk, newly electrically wired, got, to, got as a result of the technological improvements and the social upheavals of the Second World War and the decades before, a broader view of the world than vineyarders who didn't go to sea would ever have had before. Next slide, please. But there was also a darker side to the vineyard during World War II. Henry Scott's jobs at the Martha's Vineyard, Vineyard Naval Auxiliary Airfield, don't try to say that three times fast, included serving as crash officer. And that job came with three legal size paper pages of closely spaced instruction about what to do if, as all too frequently happened, one of the aircraft that was being flown out of the airfield on training missions crashed in the woods beyond the airfield, on the beaches where the target ranges were deployed or in the waters offshore. Next slide, please. Henry Scott was an artist by training, an art professor before the war, and among his papers were this sketch of a memorial to those who lost their lives at the Naval Auxiliary Airfield during the war. It may have been the distant prototype of the plaque that now hangs at the airport, listing the names of those who gave their lives while learning to be Navy aviators. Next slide. The exhibit, along with a photograph from Henry Scott's collection taken at the in Naval Air Station in the last days of the war, includes a civil defense armband that was worn by a young Harriet, Harriet Poole Otteson of Chilmark when she was an air raid warden. Among the papers that her family donated along with it was this example of a damage report in which young Harriet Poole was expected in the event that enemy bombs fell on the island to record whether they were high explosive, incendiary, or poison gas, how many casualties were trapped under the wreckage, and whether the infrastructure that might have been necessary to fight the resulting fires had been damaged, whether roads that might have brought ambulances and other emergency personnel to the bomb site had been blocked. Think about now, all these years later, the mindset that must have existed for people to print up and teach courses about how to calmly fill out these kinds of forms as, de as debris filled the streets and buildings burned and victims lay trapped under the rubble that it seems absurd now to imagine that the vineyard might have thought itself under threat of German or Japanese air attack during the war, doesn't change the fact that at the time, particularly in the early months of 1942, it seemed like a very real possibility for which people made very real preparations. Next slide, please including, in Harriet Poole's case, a series of detailed notes on the mimeographed handout she was given at her civil defense training course on how to, come, on how to counter mustard gas, new mustard powder, lewisite, and other toxic nerve agents and irritants that had been used in the trenches of World War I, and that interwar writings about the possibilities of the next war took for granted would be used against civilian populations in the next war, which in 1942 had become the current war. Our memories of World War II as a society tend to focus on the heroism of troops on far-flung shores defeating totalitarianism, or on the pluck with which people on the home front turn to to support the war effort, on the ways that the war introduced an entire generation of Americans to 
a broader view of the world. Those of us too young to have lived through it tend to forget the possibility that in, for example, the early months of 1942, the sound of engines overhead at night brought forth thoughts that perhaps this time, the bombs, the fires, the explosions, the poison gas, the crumbling buildings would in fact be real. But the archives of Harriet Poole and others are there to remind us. Next slide. Getting to the island from points elsewhere, from across New England, across the Northeast, changed profoundly at the beginning of the century preceded, the percent, at the beginning of the century covered in the exhibit. The New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad had in the mid 1910s purchased the steamship line that serviced the Cape and the islands and integrated it into its transport network. In the 1920s and 30s, the New York, New Haven and, Harp and, and Hartford went out of its way to aggressively integrate train, bus and rail travel. Next slide, please. Into a single unified network so that if you were coming from anywhere from Boston or Portland, Maine to the north or New York or New Haven or Hartford to the west or points even further beyond connecting through Boston or New York, you could travel seamlessly by train and bus and finally boat to Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket, check your bag at Penn Station and have it waiting for you on the pier at Oak Bluffs or Vineyard Haven. Next slide, please. The Great White Fleet featured in the exhibit was part of that integrated transportation network, but the transportation network didn't survive World War II. The New York, New Haven and Hartford Railroad was already faltering by 1937 and the advent of better and better train service and better and better highway networks by the end of the 1930s had all but killed the market for the old overnight steamers that ran from New York and deposited people on the docks at Fall River and for those headed to the Cape and Islands, especially New Bedford. At the end of the war, the New York, New Haven and Hartford sold off the two steamers, Nashon and New Bedford, that had been conscripted into government service, another story told in the exhibit, and kept only the two older vessels, the Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. The Nantucket and the Martha's Vineyard were in turn abruptly sold to a new company, the Massachusetts Steamship Lines, at the end of 1945. Massachusetts Steamship Lines sputtered along for perhaps 18 months and seemed on the verge of bankruptcy, which led the, which led the state government to create in 1948 the New Bedford, Woods Hole, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket Steamship Authority, the forerunner of the, current, of the present day boat line that carries cars and cargo and people to the islands. Next slide, please. The Steamship Authority, after a catastrophic decade in the late 1950s, was reformed in 1960 by a new act of the Commonwealth Legislature. The key to the new act, next slide please, was to take New Bedford out of the equation. The original Steamship Authority Enabling Act had mandated year round service from New Bedford to the islands, but that had turned out to be a gigantic cash sink that sucked up enormous amounts of money and enormous amounts of resources to run trips that were, especially in the winter, virtually empty. The, the re-enabling of the Steamship Authority in 1960 eliminated New Bedford as a port, eliminated New Bedford's voice in Steamship Authority governance, 
and place the steamship authority on a firmer financial footing. It set the stage for the steamship authority as it exists today. And there is not today, but in some future talk somewhere, an interesting story to be told in the extent to which the first 12 years of the history of the Steamship Authority still today shapes discussions of what the authority should be and what purpose it should serve and in what manner. Next slide, please. The years after World War II not only brought a profound revision of the way people reached the island, thanks to the collapse of the old New York, New Haven and Hartford integrated transport network, the rise of the automobile and the, formula, the formation of the steamship authority. It also brought about as this 1948 flyer from the Bass and Bluefish Derby collection shows, a fundamental rethinking on the part of island businesses of how the summer tourist season should be conceived. Since the beginnings of tourism on the vineyard in the years immediately following the Civil War, summer had been it for the tourist season, basically 10 weeks from late June to the beginning of September, and then the island reverted to what it had always been, a quiet fishing and farming and maritime commerce community. The founders of the Striped Bass and Bluefish Derby, who staged the original running of the event in 1946, were intent on extending the tourist season into what we now think of as the shoulders of the year. In their case, September through mid-October. This 1948 flyer touts over 15,000, yes, $15,000 worth of prizes, prizes by the carload, prizes being added daily, and so on and so forth. Note the, note the upper left-hand corner and the limitation on entries. 2,500 people. And if that seems unremarkable at a time when the summer population of the vineyard is now reckoned to exceed 100,000 people at peaks, consider what it must, what 2,500 people from off island might have felt like in the fall of 1948 when the entire population of the vineyard, check out the infographic panel in the exhibit, was well under 5,000. The Striped Bass and Bluefish Derby not only became an institution, next slide please, in which Everybody, not just expert anglers like Ser Serge Desomov or Porky Francis or whoever had an opportunity to haul in a prize winning fish, but which as the saying goes on any given Sunday or rather on any given September or October afternoon during the Derby, anybody veteran fisherman or neophyte, man, woman, or child, off-islander or on-islander, had an equal chance to win any of those $15,000 worth of prizes. But it also created a fundamentally different attitude towards what the vineyard could be as a tourist destination. Over time, of course, the Derby and fall tourism grew and the tourist season steadily extended further and further and further into the year. Next slide, please. By the 1980s, Edgartown was promoting itself as a Christmas destination, wreaths and candles in the windows and shopping and stores open long after they would have been closed back decades before for the benefit of shoppers from off island. Thomas Mayhew and the other Puritan founders of the town who had little truck with Christmas, much less Christmas as a gigantic celebration, would no doubt have been spinning in their graves, if anybody knew where their graves were. Next slide, please. 
20 years on, the early 21st century, and Christmas on the Vineyard had extended beyond Edgartown, and the promotion of it had extended beyond the island itself to elaborate, glossy brochures produced in cooperation with the Massachusetts Chamber of Commerce. Um, that is, you'll note, the museum's own catboat vanity there on the left, bedecked as befits the holiday season, with a reef hanging from its boom and a small tree tied to the head of its mast. Next slide, please. Also from the Tourism on Martha's Vineyard collection, this valiant effort at what may be the most, to deliver them what may be the most audacious tourist pitch um, ever conceived in the history of vineyard tourism. Explore the romance and solitude of Martha's Vineyard when the crowds are gone. In other words, haven't you always really wanted to come to the vineyard in February when the harbors are choked with ice and the leaves are all off the trees and you risk hypothermia walking the beaches? Um, the willingness of the vineyard to not only embrace what had traditionally not been seen as tourist seasons, but to try and create year round tourism, even in the traditionally dead months between January 1st and the spring equinox, when that remained the vineyard's last vestige of what it had once been, reverting to a time when it's mostly just Islanders, was another one of those long-term multi-decade stories that unfolded in the century when the vineyard learned to be modern. Next slide. Between 1969 and 1979, a series of splashes in the national media brought the vineyard to the attention of a wider population than had ever been aware of it before. Part of that was the emergence of a national celebrity culture over and above anything that had existed before. Publications like People and Us Magazine, which loved to run glossy profiles of prominent people like Jules Pfeiffer, Mike Wallace, Walter Cronkite, and Art Buckwald who vacationed on the vineyard. But more particularly, there were two events, one tragic, one I hesitate to say comic, but it had its moments, that focused particularly bright, intense spotlights on the eye. The first, the tragic one, was the death of Mary Jo Kopechny in Ted Kennedy's Black Oldsmobile in the waters beside Dyke Bridge in July of 1969. The Chappaquiddick incident, as it became known, and the subsequent press coverage thereof um, brought the vineyard to a much, much wider audience than had ever been aware of it before. The Kennedy inquest was national news, not just in the Boston papers, but as a collection of press coverage assembled by Helen Shirtliff Tyra. She, of the letters from, letters from World War II in that scrapbook a few slides back, as Helen Shirtliff Tyra's collection of press coverage of the Kennedy incident and inquest shows, it was covered on the front pages, not just of the Boston and New York papers, but in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in Dallas, and in lesser papers across the country and even around the world, in London, in Dublin, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. Chappaquiddick being on the front pages of national and even international newspapers inevitably led to the question, where's Chappaquiddick anyway? Which led the vineyard into the national and international spotlight. Less happily, it also put Helen Tyra, who worked for the Dukes County court system as a probation officer and was assigned Kennedy's case when he was found guilty of leaving the scene of an accident and, assign, and given a suspended sentence with six months probation. And it brought Helen Tyra very firmly into the public spotlight 
as an agent of the court and the larger criminal justice system. The Hell and Tyra collection, in addition to that extensive archive of press coverage, also includes letters written not just to the court, although we have five boxes of those in a different collection, but to herself personally, after she gave an interview to a Boston paper in which she stated properly that Kennedy would be treated like any other probationer and given no special treatment or consideration. That drew letters like this one, which accused Mrs. Tyra of being in, on the payroll of the Kennedy family, having been bought off and um, having been party to the subversion of justice by Kennedy money and power and influence. Underlined there twice in red are the words, your day will come. People will be watching you, signed true American. If that didn't lead her to call Chief Dominic Arena at the Edgartown PD and ask them to take note of the fact that people were sending her what could be construed as threatening letters, well, then she was a braver person than I would have been. Next slide, please. The same true American thought thoughtfully enclosed a copy of the relevant thing where Tyre had been quoted that Kennedy would get the same treatment as anyone else, um, which they annotated with a black crayon calling her answer bullshit and pointing to her portrait at the upper right there and indicating that in their view, she'd been bought off. Overnight, not just Helen Tyra, but Chief Arena and Edgartown Fire Department rescue diver John Farrar, grand jury foreman Wesley Leland, and many other vineyarders became national figures, whether they wanted to or not. Such was the effect of the Kennedy incident, the Kennedy Quebecney incident of 1969. Next slide, please. Also in the Tyra collection, a piece of a now extinct form of Americana known as fax lore, um, generally produced by mimeograph or spirit duplicator and circulated by photocopier or by fax machine. This one purports to be the Dublin Dispatch, the voice of the Irish free world, explaining in satirical terms that God saved Ken Senator Kennedy when he drove off the bridge on his way to midnight mass with his devout passenger. Um, for those of you who think that satirical political humor in what some might consider questionable taste began with the age of the internet, um, the Martha's Vineyard Museum archives are here to show you otherwise. Next slide, please. Everyone who was alive and conscious on the vineyard in the summer of 74 remembers when Hollywood came to town to shoot Jaws, when the Kelly House and the Harbor View were filled with um, cast and crew members, when a floating dock off the East Shop Beach Club contained several electromechanical versions of Bruce the Rogue Great White. My Memory of that summer is that some wag hung a sign on the chain link fence surrounding the surrounding the floating dock saying beware of electric shark, but I may be making that up. Next slide, please. And the story of Jaws has been told many times, the making of Jaws has been told many times in print. It's being told in a forthcoming film. It'll be told in the summer of 2025 at the museum in an exhibit on Jaws and its impact for the stage for the 50th anniversary of the film. But what's worth remembering is that Jaws, although it got a Time Magazine cover in the summer of 75, and although it had an island premiere staged at the Island Theater at Circuit Avenue, poster and ticket in the exhibit. Although Jaws created a splash that put the vineyard on the map in the summers of 74 and again in 75, 
What's easy to overlook is that Jaws has been the gift that, as far as island tourism goes, never stops giving. In 1977, Jaws 2, an entirely forgettable sequel, was filmed in part on the vineyard, producing this call sheet for cast members for one of the mayhem on the water scenes, which included the cast did. Next slide. One Tom Dumlop cast in the decidedly non-pivotable, pivotal, but significant role of Keith. Um, that's the same Tom Dunlop who went on to write for the Gazette and run the Gazette Historic Films Project and generally be one of the vineyards leading historians and chroniclers of life and so on and so forth. Thank you, Tom Dunlop, if you're listening, for donating that call sheet from a long ago film shoot to the museum's Jaws collection, along with all the other people who have donated snapshots and bits of memorabilia. Next slide, please. Like clippings from magazines celebrating the 25th and the 30th and the 40th and the 45th anniversary of the film. Next slide, please. Um, Amity Island maps and other paraphernalia for Jaws Fest 05. Next slide, please and a full-blown glossy color program from Jaws Fest, the Tribute 2012, celebrating the anniversary of the film that doesn't end in either zero or five. There are Jaws tours, there are Jaws websites, there are Jaws trivia contests, there are screenings of the movie every summer on Sunday afternoons and evenings. Jaws put the island on the map in 74 and 75, and everybody knows that. But outside of the film buff community, and specifically the Jaws fan community, it's easy to overlook the extent to which Jaws continues to keep the island on the map and has now for going on 50 years. Next slide, please. When the Steamship Authority was established in 1948, it was given the authority, pardon the expression, to license other boat lines to run to the vineyard, provided that they did not carry vehicles or heavy cargo. That right was given as a monopoly to the Steamship Authority. The, the reasoning behind that being part of that larger scale story that I keep threatening to do a program on. The passenger only boats licensed by the Steamship Authority were a fundamentally different enterprise than either the authority itself or the steamboat lines that had preceded it even back to the days when the steamboat lines had carried cars at the beginning of the century, the 19 aughts and the 1910s, only as deck cargo, not as drive on, drive off routine parts of their, their cargo. The post-World War II passenger only lines known collectively as excursion boats catered overwhelmingly, although not exclusively, to the day trippers, to the casual tourists, to the maybe come for a weekend with a suitcase and stay in a hotel in one of the down island towns crowd. They advertise themselves not as a principal means of routine everyday transportation for seasonal visitors and islanders, though some islanders and some seasonal visitors doubtless use them that way. And they ran exclusively in the traditional high season of June, July, and August, shutting down in the winter when seas grew rougher and passengers grew less frequent. Their advertising emphasized elements other than the spaciousness and reliability and smoothness of ride that the Steamship Authority touted. The Island Queen, for example, which started running out of Falmouth in 1963, 
and pulled up first to the bulkhead along Lake Avenue in Oak Bluffs and then later to the um, bulkhead just inside the Oak Bluffs jetties, touted itself almost from the get-go as the fun way to Martha's Vineyard. And those of us of a certain generation can probably actually still sing the Island Queen jingle. And if I've just gotten it stuck in your head too, I apologize. Next slide, please. The Island Queen emphasized fun, the Shamanchi, the successor to the Manassee, which ran from New Bedford through Woods Hole to Vineyard Haven, emphasized speed from historic New Bedford on the fast new Shamanchi every four hours from 9 a.m. Every four hours at a time when the Steamship Authority was running in summer every hour and, hour and a half or so might not have been the stretch that the Shamanchi people wanted it to be. But on the other hand, the Shamanchi and the Manassee before it offered beginning in the 70s, something that hadn't been available for more than 25 years, direct ferry service, albeit only passenger service from New Bedford to Vineyard Haven. Next slide, please. And next slide. High Lines, which started on Cape Cod and developed a series of excursion boat routes from Hyannis to Nantucket, Hyannis to the Vineyard, Oak Bluff specifically, and ultimately from the Vineyard to Nantucket, likewise took up with their inter island service a niche that the Steamship Authority had abandoned through the mid 1970s and perhaps later, the Steamship Authority ran a twice a day triangle route between Woods Hole, Oak Bluffs, Dantucket and back. When they shut that route down, running all their Nantucket service out of, out of Hyannis on the mainland, Highline sensed a summer opportunity and began offering inter-island cruises on its own fleet of excursion boats. Again, like New Bedford service, like fun, lighthearted service from Falmouth, um, the Highline's inter-island cruises were designed to appeal primarily to summer day trippers or summer weekend tourists. And the advent of excursion boats, the ones I've just discussed and the Kateri Tech and the Nautican before them in the 1950s, represented another shift in vineyard tourism a away from relatively long stay tourism to short term, even single day tourism made possible both by expanded highway networks on the mainland and an expanded repertoire of boats available to take you there. Next slide. You probably recognize these four images. They're the four murals painted by Chilmark's own Stan Murphy on the walls of the Tisbury Town Hall, specifically the second floor theater that was established there and named after its principal benefactor, Broadway actress and Tisbury summer resident and later retiree, Catherine Cornell. The partnership between Catherine Cornell, patron of the arts and Stan Murphy artist began in fact, immediately after World War II when Catherine Cornell answered a knock on the door of her summer home, Chip Chop, on the shores of Lake Tashmu and found a young Stan Murphy standing there looking for commissions. The result was a commission from Cornell to paint a portrait of her house, which hangs today in the creating case of the One Island Many Stories gallery. And it established a relationship between Cornell and Murphy that at the end of Cornell's life led to him being commissioned to paint the murals for the Catherine Cornell Theater. Next slide, please. That kind, that relationship between Cornell and Murphy was a personal one built on Murphy's audacity and asking one of the most famous women in American theater 
if he if she'd be interested in giving a, him a commission and Cornell's willingness to help out a struggling up and coming but obviously promisingly talented artist. But that relationship was a microcosm of a larger relationship that evolved on the vineyard really beginning in the 1920s and extending down into the present day, but particularly in the years after World War II. As the seasonal population and the, of the as the seasonal population of relatively well-to-do middle-class and upper-class homeowners on the vineyard steadily grew in the past century or so, it created an opportunity for artists, for artisans like Joseph, like glassworker Joseph Serpa, for musicians and performers and other people connected with the arts to market their work, give performances, open galleries, obtain commissions locally that would have been unthinkable in previous decades or previous centuries. The emerging bourgeois population of the island, the emerging population of well-to-do second homeowners and seasonal visitors created a market for the arts and a market for handmade crafts like serpas, bullseye glass and deck prisms and whatnot. Next slide, please. Just as it created a market for a wildly more diverse culinary scene, Helios Restaurant, which began in Edgartown and moved to State Road in Vineyard Haven in the 70s, pioneered not just Greek food on the island, as its name would suggest, but also daily themed international cuisine specialties. This hand-printed menu, for example, offered paella and other Spanish specialties on Friday, Bavarian food on Saturday, Indian curry on Sunday, and coming up the following weekend, Caribbean. This, in the 1970s, when for the most part Chinese and red sauce Italian would, would have been considered exotic in most towns the size of Vineyard Haven, Oak Bluffs, or Edgar Town. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Helios also provided an impromptu venue for live music, for jazz performances and so forth, just as the coffee shop scene in Oak Bluffs in the 60s or in Vineyard Haven, the heyday of the winter tide in the late 80s and early 90s, provided an impromptu setting for folk music performances. The availability of an art of a large and thriving market for arts, for high end crafts, for what would have seemed in America in the 60s, 70s, and 80s outside of major cities like exotic cuisine for jazz and folk music gave the vineyard a, an artistic and cultural and culinary life in the 60s and 70s and 80s that attracted more young chefs, more musicians, more artists, more artisans. Next slide, please. People like Heather Goff, whose appointment, people like Dan Waters, people like Allison Shaw and Potter Tom Thatcher, who were able to, cr to craft audience, to find audiences and commissions and to build art-centered, music-centered, cuisine-centered lives in, on the vineyard that in previous decades and previous generations would have been impossible, might well have been impossible almost anywhere outside of a major city. Last slide, please. And Heather Goff, one tiny piece of that emerging, what I refer to in the exhibit as bourgeois bohemian cultural fusion in the 
April 13th page of her 1982 desk calendar depicted the yellow house on State Road in Chilmark, the one at the top of Quitza Hill that had been built and lived in for many years in the late 19th century by Jared and Jerusha Mayhew, farmers, keepers of sheep, well-to-do citizens of the town, and two of the most prominent members of the last generation or two of the Chilmark deaf community. One of the profound things about the artistic and musical community that emerged on the vineyard in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, fueled by the availability of a large, well-heeled market for their goods and their services, was the extent to which that they created lives and to which they created work that, like Goff's pen and inks, were deeply and specifically rooted in the culture of the island. And on that note, I'm going to end this round of Hidden Collections. Thank you all for tuning in. And if you haven't seen Learning to be Modern, do stop by the museum the next time you're in. It's on display in the Green Family Gallery until, I believe, the 22nd of March. Oh, thank you so very much for that. That was absolutely fabulous, as always. We have just one question that came up during the presentation, and it is one that seems pretty easy to answer, at least with someone with your depth of knowledge. Um, I have a question from Doug Thompson asking if Dr. Mills was actually featured in the Whaling film. That's a great question to which I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Um, but if you would like to shoot me an email, library at mvmuseum.org, um, I am always especially interested in the next great question about Martha's Vineyard on film, and I will see if I can track that down. Very good. Thank you, Bo. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And please make sure to mark your calendars for next month's edition of Hidden Collections. We will be doing this again on, let me just make sure I'm giving you the right information, on Wednesday, January 5th of 2022 at the same time, 1230. And we will be talking about New Year, New Acquisitions. So a look behind the scenes at the Martha's Vineyard Museum. Thank you all very much for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. Mm -hmm.